Death Wish series is the increasingly desperate porn starlet of action films. Out of the gate, she swore she'd only unclasp her brassiere for the sake of sufficiently artistic photographs. But five films later, she's on Ron Jeremy's speed dial and regularly steam cleaning horse spunk out of her dress. As such, the original Death Wish, like other similar films of the period, such as Dirty Harry, is a product of its time. Our president had his skull blown the fuck off his shoulders on national TV, his successor torched most of Asia, and his successor turned out to be a thieving, lying, manipulative cunt. <laughs> or in colloquial parlance, a politician. The streets ran to overflowing with disaffected youth turning to crime and delinquency to pay the rent, and the police seemed more interested in seizing your defensive firearms and collecting traffic fines than preventing the omnipresent violence. Where the hell were you guys? Giving out parking tickets? But enough about modern-day Detroit, because America was really fucked up in 1974, too, and the only solution, as it inevitably is, was Charles motherfucking Bronson. When murder and rape are the crimes, Bronson is the only punishment. Paul Kersey is a pacifist, soft-spoken, left-wing architect whose immediate family are about to become acutely aware of the cardinal rule of death wish. To be related to Charles Bronson is to fucking die. At the hands of Jeff Goldblum in a Jughead hat. Because reasons! I'll get it. Who is it? Groceries, man. <laughs> Goddamn rich cunt! I kill rich cunts out of pain, man. I'm gonna be your goddamn mom. Well, I guess life really did find a way. <laughs> Shit, let's split. Must go faster. My name is Paul Kersey. How's my mic? I'm sorry. She died a few minutes ago, Mr. Kersey. With his wife murdered, his daughter catatonic, and the blood-caked rivulets of his idyllic upper-middle-class suburban existence lying in tatters at his feet, he pulls himself up by his mustache. Yes, slowly but surely, mild-mannered Paul Kersey gives way to Charles fucking Bronson. If the police don't defend us, maybe we ought to do it ourselves. We're not pioneers anymore, Dad. What are we, Jack? What do you mean? I mean, if we're not pioneers, what have we become? What do you call people who, when they're faced with a condition of fear, do nothing about it? They just run and hide. Now, French, I believe. <laughs> en français. <laughs> But where is a Bronson made? From whence does his spindly hipster mustache defiantly refuse to connect? And more to the point, where does this buff middle-aged bastard learn how to blow a bitch's face clean off? Well, I'm going to give you vacation. From New York, that is. The Jane Chill development of Tucson, Arizona. That's right, asshole. Arizona gave you fucking death wish, and we take our payment and blowjobs. Remember to cut the balls, ladies. Of course, upon touching down, Bronson and the home viewing audience quickly learn that Tucson, Arizona has inexplicably relocated to borderline offensive regional stereotypes, USA. Probably one of them knee-jerk liberals thinks us gun boys will shoot our guns because it's a, an extension of our penises. I never thought about it that way. It could be true. Ooh, dirty Turkish hark of back flack and fort and fill a buck of Martin, Perkaluma Burton, Dirty Bush, Night and Martin, and Adam Hole. I suppose that explains why Tommy Lee's personal defense weapon is a fucking bazooka. But we can thank J.R. Ewing over here for at least setting Charlie straight on one fucking detail. Hell, a gun's just a tool. My feeling is that, uh, you know, the more guns that are available, the more likelihood of them being used incorrectly. Chris, that's a Russell Brand haircut. Boy, I don't know what happened. I went to meet Barber at the shop and I come out, I'm looking like this. <laughs> You're talking different from how I talk. Here's a bunch of money to be on TV. Upon returning to New York, Bronson mode is in full effect, which he immediately demonstrates in an ill-fated late-night jaunt by the Hudson. You got money, man? Shit, I'll kill you. Give me your money, I'll bust you up. Wait, a mugger with a gun? But in New York, guns are outlawed. Well, now I've seen everything. And 
injustice. Of course, he deals with the fallout of his first kill by briefly devolving from Bronson to Callista Flockhart. <laughs> From this point on, Bronson full-on turns into fucking Batman, not the pussy post-60s neutered Batman who pisses his little black panties if he so much as steps on a fucking roach, the hard-ass gun-toting 40s Batman, the detective in a Dracula cape who killed the shit out of commies. Make pain to base. Under attack by commie Nazis. <laughs> I surrender! Not so fast. <laughs> he soon stumbles on an old man having his head caved in by three random hoods, one of whom is a much younger but no less dapper Denzel Washington in his first filmic role, and introduces himself to the future Hollywood star as only Charles Bronson can. Cops comb the seam, no doubt busily concocting a story about Denzel at a corner store purchasing Skittles and Sprite, Bronson goes from 40s Batman to Punisher. Let's see, two oblivious hoods, Paul Kersey alone in an otherwise abandoned subway car, fresh bag of groceries as bait. It's over, Anakin! I have the high ground! I'm sorry, what in the fuck did these chiclet brains think was gonna happen? As far as I'm concerned, if you willfully place yourself in a 5x20 metal box with a murderous mustache with a magnum, your ass legally belongs to Bronson. Oh, but he doesn't stop there. He's dealt with smackheads, he's curb stop muggers, and even train robbers. And now it's time to single-handedly solve New York's prostitution problem. <laughs> These prospective muggers break the two cardinal rules of petty crime. One, never bring a knife to a gunfight. And two, never bring a weapon of any description to a fight with Charles Bronson. His comb over is impervious to projectile weapons. His mustache was woven from Kevlar, and there isn't a Swiss Army knife on this planet that wouldn't snap clean the fucking Dwayne after a stiff look from this motherfucker. All the same, Afro Samurai over here gets impossibly lucky and manages to shank him in the shoulder just in time to take two in the kidneys. Nearby police give pursuit, but Bronson, as we all know, is still in full Batman mode. Recovering from his cat scratch, Kersey decides to take in the New York social scene, only to discover he's probably more famous than fucking Batman. I'll tell you one thing, the guy's a racist. You notice he kills more blacks than whites. Oh, for Pete's sake, Gary, more blacks are muggers than whites. What do you want us to do, increase the proportion of white muggers who will have racial equality among muggers? Of course, by now, Detective Bacon Jowls is hot on Kersey's trail, but with crime down, he doesn't have the green light from Mayor de Blase to actually arrest the motherfucker. Suppose this Paul Kersey is the vigilante. All right. Let's say that. We don't want him. I'll try to scare him off. But that's as far as I'll go. That's right, Frank. Scare him off. Scare him off. Yeah, good fucking luck with all that, asshole. Is it even possible to startle Charles Bronson? This guy was making films well into his 80s because the Grim Reaper wouldn't even have a phone conversation with the motherfucker, and you think patting him down for guns and sending him spooky telegrams is gonna drive him screaming into the hills? New York's finest, Rageaholics. Mr. Kersey, you're under police surveillance. You're being watched. No asshole, police surveillance is being Bronsoned. So despite the crack security force camping outside his front door and nowhere the fuck else, the vigilante manages to ninja out the back door and into the waiting arms of three incredibly unfortunate shitbags. <laughs> And apparently one of the muggers is goddamn bullseye because he actually manages to hit the man. This ain't over. Yet despite having a bum lag, he pursues and actually quarters said shitbag, leading to a simultaneous moment of euphoric badassery and full-on comedy. Fill your hand. Huh? Draw. Oh, <laughs> 
Apprehended by police with his gun matched to the bullets in each of his victims, one would think Kersey's number would officially be the fuck up. But thankfully, it turns out that Paul Kersey's death wish... Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! ...was in fact a mild warning wish. We find it necessary to make you a proposition since you are not going to favor us by dying. You uh, work for a company with lots of offices. Get a transfer to another city, and I'll drop this gun in the river. We want you to get out of New York. Permanently. Well, at least his death-wishing days are finally through. Or are they? Excuse me. Cut and Bronson. The original Death Wish, beyond being far and away the best pure movie experience in the franchise, is also one of the most important films of the 1970s, and considering the caliber of film we were treated to in the 70s, that is saying goddamn plenty. Death Wish is simultaneously one of the most prominent explorations of the contemporary politics of the 70s, and even 2014. From gun control, to victims' rights, to post-traumatic stress disorder, to capital punishment, police corruption, vigilantism, and urban decay, but most impressively of all, despite all these weighty issues, thanks to Bronson's monolithic performance in a script that's tighter than a latex unitard, it still manages to entertain emphatically well. It's Bronson, it's the 70s, it's a fucking classic. Watch this movie. I'm Razor Fist. God fucking speed.